Today, I have the great honor and joy of introducing Hannah Orstovic and Lisa Gozosti to discuss and celebrate the release of The Pastor. Hannah Orstovic is one of the most admired and prominent writers in contemporary Norwegian fiction. She published her first novel, Cut, in 1994, and has gone on to write a number of acclaimed novels that have been translated into more than 16 languages. She has also been awarded a host of literary prizes, including the Dublug Prize, presented annually for Swedish and Norwegian fiction by the Swedish Academy. Martin Aiken's English translation of Love was a finalist for a National Book Award and winner of the 2019 Penn Translation Prize. Her novel, Tiamo, is forthcoming from our dear friends at Archipelago Books. And today's moderator is our own Lisa Gazashti, co-owner at Brookline Booksmith. She has worked at the Booksmith since 1999 and is one of the store's most passionate advocates of international literature. She is known for her exquisite taste and is beloved in Brookline, Boston, and beyond. I'm so thrilled to have them here together in conversation. And now, Hannah and Lisa. Hello, Hannah, and welcome. It's such a beautiful joy and a privilege to have you here with us today. Um, I thought we could start by having you read uh, some a passage, a paragraph or two in, in your own language in Norwegian for us. You want me to read in English? No, I'd like you to read in Norwegian. I'm going to read oh, a bit later you. in English. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank so, you so much. So let it rip. We want to, we want to hear you fully, okay? So uh, can I read the, this is the Norwegian version of the pastor. Can I read the first page? Please. In, in Norwegian? Yeah, read as much as you like. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions and then I'm going to read later in English. Thank you. So I'll just read the, the, the start of the, of, the no, of the novel. Dette er Jesu blod. Jeg tog et skritt til siden, helt til vin i det neste lille blanke begere. Jeg så... I just have to ask, how is the sound? Is it is it okay? Do you have to speak louder? Uh, okay, everything okay? Yes, okay. it's good. Good. So I'll do it from the start again. Okay. Good. Dette er Jesu blod. Jeg tog et skritt til siden, helt i vin i det neste lille blanke begere. Jeg så på de bøyde hodene foran mig ett og ett hode, en og en og en. Og sånn skulle det være, tenkte jeg. Her skal du få komme og være en. Her er du utvalgt, enestående. Her blir du sett, her får du være. Du, det hjalp mig også. Vi. Alteringen var en begynnelse. Halbuen var et tegn som viste at det fantes en større cirkel, og en cirkel utenfor der igjen. Og en enda større cirkel, et uendelig stort lysende rom. Og at vi alle fikk være der, sammen, og vær for oss, vær enkelt og alene. Her, her får du finnes, her kan du vil være. Dette er til for dig. Det var stille litt, som om de var samlet i en vifte her rundt halvbuen, og at fra alle ryggene foran mig gikk det streker ut i landskapet, ut i det åpne flate, ut over fjellet, ut over havet, videre ut over. Det sluttet ikke, det fortsatte. De hadde tatt det med seg inn. Snart skulle de reise seg. Etterpå ville de skyve dørene opp og gå ut igjen dit. Spres. Beautiful. I just want to say as, as we begin that I absolutely adored this book. Um, you capture the interior life in beautiful hallowed detail with language that conveys such a redemptive stillness 
that the reader feels her senses being reborn one by one. There's a hush that falls over the pages as one reads them so that the sound of a twig breaking, for example, resonates to fill the air as if it were the first and the only sound in the world. The remote Norwegian landscape has a captivating presence in quiet. And I wanna ask you how, how conscious were you about establishing this permeating quality of stillness as you were writing this work? I think I think I think I just wrote it the way it had to be for myself. Uh, this landscape is the landscape of my childhood, where I grew up from when I was born till I was sixteen. Then we moved to Oslo, but but this is the landscape of my childhood, which is the very north of Norway. Uh, it's beyond Finland. It's it's. It's beyond the north, the polar circle. So it's 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 in the Arctic, uh, um, Arctic. How does how do you call it? It's 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 flat. It's Arctic. It's very cold. So it's kind of so there are no mountains. It's just uh, the horizon and almost no. Mm, trees uh, just and then there is the sky so it's 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 a very kind of empty empty landscape but still very kind of filled with with light and with shifts of light and with shifts of 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 darkness and 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 even even during the the, the dark parts of the year the light is very very present because it's an in, it's a kind of in indirect light because it, it it's a light from beyond beyond the horizon that the light becomes kind of an indirect light which is filled with color it's a darkness that and then it comes this kind of light of 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 pink of orange of of purple, of green, of it, it's all this strange color. So it's 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 a kind of a magic, magic landscape. But it's very kind of also a land a landscape of of of, uh, of loneliness because it's it's empty. There are no one else there. Uh, what did you really ask me about? I fell out of your answer. Well, you, you answered it, I think, you know, pretty beautifully, I think, um, and you bring right out the landscape even even more. Um, I was just asking about the, the quality, because it's, I think, such a beautiful quality of stillness. I don't think I've ever seen it captured the way you captured in this book. And I'm somebody who spent my entire life in search of stillness. So I, I, I think it's just what you've done is astonishing. I was just wondering how, how it came to be. But I think what you're saying is that you, it's sort of your relationship in a sense with the land, the landscape itself. There's something about tracking those changes that you have that requires incredible attention or something some opening of yourself, some emptying of yourself in a sense to see what's there. So anyway, that, that's just what I was, I was just wondering and I think you answered it well, well no, enough. No, 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 I want to, I, I want to track this thing because, because I, I, I think it's very interesting because I, I have never related to the word stillness before. What is stillness? What is stillness? You, well, actually, your translator can probably talk to you about it because it's in his book. Stillness is the stillness. I think is um, the it's sort of the presence in the absence. It's the, an animating an animated quality of attention and life that exists in sort of a void space. It's it's something that can't be seen, but it's a palpable force. Uh, it, that's you know simply inanimate, and of course, 
it's part of silence, but it's not just silence. It's something, something pulsing with uh, a presence. Mm -hmm. That makes sense in my, in my understanding of it anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It gives very much sense. It's it's such a, such a beautiful word. I haven't I have never used it before. I'm so happy you say so because I'm I'm so curious about the translation because yeah because, because this novel for me the pastor is a novel that I wrote. I wrote this novel uh, coming out from a, a depression, a very deep depression that I had, uh, I, I wrote a novel, the novel before I wrote was a, was a novel that was to me very important discussing what is truth, what is truth in literature and language. And it came out in, in Norway two years before this and, and, and it was totally kind of, it was both acclaimed and turned totally down so it was and and to me it was what I wrote was so obvious I was kind of saying that we have to deal with literature is so precious and we have to deal with the truth of literature and and it's so obvious what it's all about and then I wrote this novel and then it was kind of not kind of it was not received in a way that I could kind of, and of course, I guess it was my own process that I was kind of projecting out in my literary work. But but anyhow, so so I went into a deep process when I read a lot of I read a lot of uh, Master Eckhart, Master Eck, Master Eckhart, the German. Uh, yeah. Mystery of the 16th century and, and a lot of uh, Heidegger and other things and, and, and kind of existential things. And also I had done a lot of research on this uh, uh, Sami revolt uh, that I had done years before and I never knew what it would kind of end if I would ever use it to something, but it was so, it's, it felt so, so important to me that revolt. And so all these threads somehow went together and I was in this deep kind of, uh, after the, the rejection, rejection that I felt for, for that novel before the priest, uh, the pastor, I, 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 I really felt that uh, I was kind of outside, outside the world outside the literary world so 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 i i think i used this is the cover of the norwegian the priest mm. and it this is the church that is uh, in in the landscape because the 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 german after the second world war the germans they burned down all all the all the tree buildings in in finnmark mm. when they retired because they wanted to, to, to slow down the Russian soldiers. So they burned down everything that was to be burned. This is one of the only churches that has been left. And this is a church of Nesseby. And this is kind of, uh, so this is the, the, the landscape, the horizon, and this tiny little church uh, that somehow was in my imagination when I wrote the novel. But... Uh, yes, so so I started to write this novel from 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 this from this very kind of outside outside outsider point uh, of of existence, and I think I, I I wrote it. Leave, which is the name of the main character, means life. Mm. So leave leave means life. So to me, it was. Uh, a question of life and death. So when you talk about I, when you talk about the language in the novel, I get so deeply, deeply grateful to Martin Atkins. He is a wonderful translator, and I'm so deeply grateful because because to me, to me this novel, to me this novel is not about conception it's not about concepts it's not about really the thoughts it's about 
it's about the language in which those thoughts are contained. I think I think okay. the, the, the concept of, of containing is is for me the the most important thing of the novel. The the young girl, which is 19 years old, who kind of kills herself, that falls down. She falls down because there is nothing to hold her up. So it's I think to me in the whole novel is kind of is there something in our existence that can hold us when we fall? And yeah. if if there is no God, if there is no, if there is nothing, what can hold us? I mean, are we totally kind of left out, or is there something? And I and I think that when I wrote the novel, I was kind of okay, okay, I give up. Maybe there is nothing, but there is language, there is beauty, there is mm. the holding of, there is the holding of the sound of the voice. There is the whole, and for me, in a way, maybe it's very close to, to the sound of the voice of, 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 of the mother of the, of the newly born. This kind of existence doesn't have any meaning if there isn't uh, an accoglienza, uh, how do you say that in English? Of, of, of being of being received in language, which is not mm -hmm. conceptual, but it's like the holding of the rhythm of the voice of of the love in the tone of mm. the love, and 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 for me in the Norwegian version, I think I have put all my love into into the sound of the language, so I'm. To be honest, I've been so afraid of reading the English version, even though I love Martin Eitken and I love his work. I've been so afraid of reading how it sounds in English because I've been so afraid of losing. Maybe yeah. there is no, maybe there is no mother who's holding this text. No, no, he does an absolutely beautiful job and I've just read it twice. And I could literally read it again like a song. Like I read it like, like, like I could just Yoo read it. You absolutely adore, adore this book. So I'm going to ask you a few more questions, okay? In light of what you were just saying. Um, so leave, which I'd love to know that that means life. Um, she speaks emphatically of her longing to be able to say we to exist in a place where that was even possible. This novel is a portrait of becoming led by Liv's yearning to be with what simply was, to be and to be allowed to be. And I want you to explain more about this phrase, this to be and be allowed to be true so intimately, this, this equation and how is this yearning central to your novel? What do you mean? I, tell me, ask me a little bit more. Yes, what do you mean? She, she says in, in, in English anyway, she's, she's throughout the novel yearning to have a space to simply exist, a, pl a place of welcome. And many of the other characters, of course, are longing for the same, a place where they can simply be, a place where they can be held. That's what you're talking about, I think, when you're talking about this, the mother this, this place of, of um, sort of a sacred place of hold, holding, you know, a place where, where you can dwell in, in safety and, in, 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 and take refuge. Um, and, and many of the characters uh, in, in, in the novel, of course, are suffering with loneliness uh, despair, and they're sort of exiled within themselves. They, they can't even be at home in their own bodies, much less in the company of another person. Um, and I think that Leave, as the, as the novel unfolds, begins to gather new understanding about what it means to take residence you know, in your own soul, as well as in, in communion, as, as, as simple and frail as it is with, with other human beings. So there's a lot of, there's a lot I want to talk to you about language 
Can I ask you one more question? Because I know you're going to. Yes, you know, just go, go, go. Okay, so that's that's the backdrop. But then, I, all right, so I want to say this other thing about language, which is, so this, this book is a book about belonging, coming home, and healing as much as it is about loss, isolation, and loneliness. It's about yes, the you are so and, right. You are so right. Yes. <laughs> no, just don't talk. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's about the faltering, stumbling, innocent ways we betray ourselves and one another or miss each other entirely. How do we find what's real or know the true thing in a murky, incohate world where maybe nothing is what it seems? The novel describes a friendship between Liv and Christiane. Liv believes Christiane to be happy, self-assured, light, until she comes to realize something else entirely. She is forced then to question, and this is your words in the translation, how much can our language contain and how much can it bear? What do our words carry inside them? How do they work? How is it that we communicate with each other using words and this is me saying, and yet fail one another repeatedly. How do we navigate the clashes that exist between our hopes for communion with one another and the day-to-day -day shocks of each other's individual hardships and complexities? And I'm asking you now, Hannah, as, as Liv herself asks, are words enough to communicate at a profound level with another person or even with ourselves? Is language enough to hold us or do we need something more? That is such a good question. I, I think, I think that I, I think that what I tried to do in that novel, I start to answer with the novel and then I, then I will answer more broadly. But I think what I tried to do in that novel was to kind of what I tried to do in that novel was I did something for myself. I need that I needed that novel for myself because I was in a I, I that novel was for myself uh, a question of life and death. I, I kind of ventured myself into this novel and I kind of asked the novel to kind of okay, let's do this journey together. I put leave into this journey and, and you novel, you will, we will have this dialogue and you will tell me life or death. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's venture it. So, uh, but, but in the novel, I, I really found that uh, what kind of carried on in language was the emotion in language, the, and for me, that is also literature. That is, that is what moves me in literature. That's, that is what makes it indispensable to read is that language is, is a gateway to love when it is, when it is real language, when language is really kind of with no kind of closure or defense or hiding, or when it is kind of, okay, here I am, this is it, let's meet. And I, I think that's also what I really want from, from true meeting with other peoples in real life. Uh, but somehow, in 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 writing and reading that is also what is happening because i'm lonely when i write and you are lonely we are all lonely when we read so it's kind of it's it's a, it's it has the potential for a very very deep and true meeting because we are kind of we we are kind of protected we are not exposed to very many other uh variables so so in a way we 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 are we can be quite open writing and reading and that is a big 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 
we can reach each other on a very deep level level in those things and and and, and i think that that uh, is she frozen? Are you frozen? I'm not frozen, are you? Yes, she's frozen. Okay. I, yes, I think we're, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with Hannah. She'll be back in a second, hopefully. If she's not, I'm going to start reading from her book because I have a great passage to read. I'll give her three seconds to make it back. Okay, I'm going to start reading since while she comes because I was about to tell her that um, what she was talking about about language, the the power of language. Uh, in in this book, there you see over and over again the failures of language, um, and 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 then there is there is something that comes through as she's talking about uh, that has to do with love in language, uh, and I think. This passage I'm about to read explains a little bit of that. Um, so here she's asking herself, and this this passage is is a bit about the Sami as well and the failures that occurred in language there in in that in that rebellion, which had everything to do with the Sami uh, reading uh, reading the Bible, uh, having the Bible available to them in their own language, and then understanding the text uh, to be an invitation to their own radical awakening and uh, then they move forward with that idea that they too shared in um, the promise of, of God and then they came to find out that no it wasn't meant for them that way um, and that's a complicated story but here's the here she's asking about that and she says quote how could language in all of its plasticity become so stiff and unbending as hard as a wall what part of us made it so? How did I come across in this respect? What walls held me captive? And what did they prevent me from seeing? I felt like I had reached an impasse. I needed to unlock the words and open them up, find space within them. That was what I wanted, but would I be able? I was standing at a boundary and the landscape was open all around as far as my eye could see. Endless, edgeless, a seamless expanse. Are we together again? Yes, we're together, and I'm just reading a beautiful section of your. Good, uh, Good. Go, on. go on, go okay. on. Um, I was standing at a boundary, and the landscape was open all around as far as the eye could see. Endless, edgeless, a seamless expanse stretching away into nothingness. This was where I'd come to. I could find no purchase. Everything petered out, words dissolved, and whatever I did turned out differently than I'd imagined. But there is another boundary, a fence I can neither scale nor walk around. I stand gripping its cold steel, my face pressed against the mesh, the wires digging into my flesh. I'm getting nowhere. I can't understand. It makes no sense. I don't know what to do. Surrender, the voice inside me says, the voice in my head that always has an answer. Then speak to me, tell me how, just tell me how and I'll surrender. I can't do it on my own. And so I was reading this passage in, in the sense of how is it that we return to language 
when we've been betrayed by language, when language has fallen fallen short, uh, when it has 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 become meaningless or flat. And I think this is one of the ways back in, into the beauty and power of languages through this surrender. Um, you know, this, this, this acceptance, this being with things as they actually are, which is what the character Leave comes to do. She comes to this uh, beautiful, humble acceptance of the actual existence around her, however kind of paltry that is. It's, she begins to see, you know, the beauty and the roughness, and and um, she she actually comes to this 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 word, which again in English is called wobbly. She comes to see that what's the most important is not this kind of refined edge, um, but it's this kind of shaky, wobbly, unsteady thing that's you know always in a state of emerging, but not. Not ever, not ever full. It's kind of an active state of of becoming, but it is wobbly, and that that's the child, right? That's the child that wants to be cared for by the mother. It's that kind of wobbly, frail and tender thing. Um, and and I think as as the novel um, unfolds, she comes to have a a better sense of caring for that within herself. And of course, within within her parishioners, you know, the people that she so desperately wants to to tend, you know, as part of her own her own healing, and also as part of her, um, you know, her 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 bond with you know with God, you know, because she recognizes God as being that which binds humanity together, that which provides a place for all. It's a simple practice of, of providing. Um, welcome and comfort, extending the hand. It's just that simple gesture. Um, now I don't even know what my question is. So you have to just jump in. Now you can jump in extemporaneously. <laughs> you are saying it so beautifully. I don't want to say anything. I just want to listen to you. Nope. <laughs> say, say, say more. Say more. It's wonderful. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because all this. I've I've been doing these thoughts lately because I've been working so much with translate with translations um, the last uh, the last years. Uh, so I've been thinking so much about what is what is really kind of what is really the important thing for me in language, and I think for me this novel uh, the pastor is really. I don't have the English version, so I showed the Norwegian one. Um, it's really, for me, this is, for me, it's, it's the big leap into language has always been in, in very important for me when I've been reading, writing, but this is for me the big step into leaning into language as a place to be as a place of existence. And because when I could read another passage in Norwegian that would make you really, I think, understand what I mean. Uh, if, if that's okay that with you. That would be amazing, yeah, please. It would be in Norwegian, I don't know what, but okay. Yeah. It's about it's about the riot, the, the Sami riot. Uh, about Leave is thinking about the Sami riot in eighteen hundred fifty two, and and she's thinking about it because she is identifying so much about she's identifying so much deeply in herself with not the riot as a thought, but more as the the energy of it, the kind of the, the need to can, do that. Can right? you actually, can you hold on one second? Can you, because I talked about that when you were off, off. Can you explain just briefly before uh, what your sense of the origin of that rebellion was? What was the clash, what, what, what generated that clash? Can you help yes. us um, it, 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 it's, I think it's extremely interesting in, in, in as one as one example of the of the colonial history in the world, which is extremely kind of exotic because it's so there are so few people involved, but it's such a kind of 
very clear and and and, and polite po uh, clean, polished point uh, um, in the very very north of Norway uh, there were this Sami people that are kind of in, ingenious people of, of Norway Sweden Finland of Russia in the north kind of North Pole uh, area uh, um, and and uh, and and the Norwegian authorities had been sending priests, uh, um, sheriffs, like police uh, officers. And um, well, I think those two were kind of the legal parts of, and then they wanted from, from the Sami people, they wanted taxes, of course, they wanted income for the state. And of course they wanted also to, to, to have some, the control and power so of course all the colonial questions and but what happened this conflict that was kind of building up un until 1850 51 52 with this colla with this grand uh, adventure in 1852 was that uh, was that the bible had been uh, translated into the sami language so that they suddenly had the access to this text. And of course, the New Testament is quite a revolutionary text, which, is, which says that you are all the same to God. You are all, I mean, you're all kind of, you're all in, you're all, you all have the same right in front of God. So, so in a way they kind of, finally they could say that, oh, but this text give us, they give us legitimacy to how do you say legitimacy? It, legitimacy. it makes yeah. as a, to, to 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 kind of say that the power that you have been putting upon us is not righteous. We we are all the same. We we can we can ask for another order. So it's it's uh it's a very political rebellion that they that they make but they make it in in the name of of a religious uh riot uh and and they make it in a very kind of extreme and violent way because they they kill they kill the priest they kill uh, they kill the norwegian salesman and they put things on fire and it, it's a very bloody and very very kind of emotional riot uh, but it but what i find very but the what i find very interesting it, it is it that is very, it is it has its it is legitimized in in language in in their kind of reading of the bible it's it's so it's all about language it's all about having access to another kind of 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 uh, that another another kind of language has been made possible for them that 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 makes them feel equal. Of course, it it doesn't make them feel equal, but they see this little kind of opening that equal equality might be possible. That in the Bible it says that it should be. So, so they're fighting for this equality in some way or some kind of righteousness. And I find that is so interesting because I find that, I mean, isn't that in the core of our life always? I mean, in a way I find, I found that conflict so extremely, uh, of course it is an a, a historical, very concrete, very political, colonial, very concrete political uh, and religious uh, happening in, in, in Norwegian religious history. But I find it also a conflict that is so extremely uh, uh, existentially, potentially describing for a conflict that we all can live at any time in our lives that 
we should we have the right to be loved i mean we there is something that tells us that i i am worthy next to everyone else i even me can be loved next to everyone else and and why is it not so and i want that to become real i want that to become true and i'm willing to 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 do everything to defend that possibility and i find that is such a deep and profound thing uh, so i so i so i i so that's kind of what, what i used in the novel because because I think that is profoundly what we can all kind of relate to. Uh, yeah. So, but if, if it's okay, I, I'll, I'll read this little passage in Norwegian to kind of show you how it, how it sounds. Because for me, the important thing in this novel is that the legitimacy, the legitimacy of, of, of this is one thing is 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 the concepts and and the and the justice and the laws and blah 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 but i find that in in the very deep layers of literature what really pronounce our deep truth is 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 the sound of the language is really what kind of can carry the deep truth of our lives that this sounds very, very, very something very pretentious, but 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 I think it is but I think language is 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 that important that it has to do with with carrying what what is what it is to to be alive. Det var ikke noen uten skyld. De drepte med kniv og øks. De tente på huset. Det var ikke rent. Ikke fra noen av partene var det hellig og rent og fint. Ingen hadde rett. Det som skulle vært felles og åpent og sant, var skittent og forvrengt. Men det var noe annet. Det var noe med opprøret i seg selv. Det ville ustyrlige. Det i dem som kjente at det fantes noe som var sant. Jeg tenkte at de kjente det rive og tvinge seg fram i dem. At de ville og måtte grave det fram, skjære det ut, som de gjorde med regnen de slaktet. Finne noe som var fast til å holde i hendene som et levende, blankt og klissete hjerte. De ville se et punkt hvor det var noe som ikke sviktet. De ville ha en innrømmelse fra presten og lensmannen og handelsmannen. De ville komme fram til høyden av fjellet og se ut over den andre siden. Se det lovede landet, hvordan det var. At vannet lå der det var blitt sagt dem. At det rant en bekk der, nedover på skrå. At det var lyng og kjær og myrer til venstre. At det lå som det lå. At det var som det var. At det fantes noe fast, et punkt som ikke var til å rikke. Men kniven gikk gjennom skjorta og inn i huden, inn i kjøttet. Kjøttet var bare blod. Blodet rant, det var bare blod. Og huset var til å tenne på. Det brant ned. Hva var det da språket var et språk for? Hva hjalp det da med ordene? Det var ingen hjelp noe sted. Det var ingen vegg, ingen grense. Ikke noe feste. Jeg tror... I'm sorry, I'm just in Italy, so I'm just talking to you strictly in Italian. 
but uh, yeah. That was absolutely beautiful. I, I think we have to, um, Pierce, do we have people dying to ask questions? We, we do have a few questions already and people, if, if you wanna send one in, we have some time. So uh, don't miss out on this opportunity. That was beautiful, Hannah, thank you. Oh, what a beautiful conversation. Okay, so the first question is from Jennifer. She asks, I loved the way you interwove the language of Astrid Lundgren's children literature within the structure of the pastor. How has she and or other authors shaped your writing? Mm, uh, I didn't really get it. What, one small piece. Astrid Lundgren, you've um, included her work in the pastor. How has her writing and others, other authors, what have how they how have they shaped your literature? Well, well, who knows? I guess they all shaped, but but I think Astrid Lundgren has been extremely ex extremely important for me, uh, mostly because she. I think my my. Do you still see me? Is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So I would just let me know if it's not okay. Um, Astrid Lindgren is is my favorite writer. I have the Bible and some others, but she is my. I think because she is she has been so extremely non so extremely non corrupted. She has, she, to, she always said that to her language is about emotions and she has been so extremely forward in, in, in this pure, pure language, being able to talk about the deepest, the deepest desperate loneliness that we have in a way that is totally accessible and, and with images that, that at least I can use in my life over and over again. And I think, well, I don't think, I know that my favorite Astrid Lindgren novel is Miu, Miu, my Miu. But I also think that Ronja Röverdatter Ronja, I don't, Ronja, the robber's daughter, I don't know how you say that in English, but that is also beautiful how she and the boy that they have this, they have to jump over this pass that is kind of where if they fall down this pass, they will die. So they both jump to reach it, each other. And I find all these kind of all these images that are so they're so simple, but so true and so deep and so real. And I find that is, I think I find that is to, to be, to, to have the courage to be so, so pure in writing is, is a beautiful thing. And are there other writers who have shaped your, your writing? Oh, I guess. I guess I would have been nothing without 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 other writers. But well, one of the first uh, of, I grew up I grew up with the Bible, so I'm I'm a very biblical writer. So I I, I have the Bible, I have Astrid Lindgren, and then I have the Swedish writer who's called Per Olof Enqvist, who wrote a beautiful little novel that was extremely important for me to start writing, and it's called. Fallen Angel, Fallen Angel. And then I've read a lot of Marguerite Duras, a lot of, and of course, uh, Virginia Woolf, and also uh, um, uh, what's, what's his name again? Oh, Absalom, Absalom, as I lay dying, William Faulkner, of course, mm -hmm. William Faulkner. As I lay dying, all, all those things that I read when I was very young has been very important for me. So a lot of things, and still, and, but still now, still now, it's not that it kind of was those that I read when I was twenty years old. It's still now that I, still now I can feel that oh, 
please let me show me how can I do something new. So right now I'm reading right now I'm reading uh, Ali Smith, the English writer, and I find her she is totally free in her way. I find she's hilariously free, and I find that is so she's totally different from me. I could never write like her, but but to 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 kind of to to see how it's possible, I think that is also uh, to 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 be nourished by how to how how to be free, how to how to kind of use things, how to that things are possible. That is wonderful. Lovely, thank you. Um, Greg says, thank you so much for this lovely conversation. You've spoken of starting each book with a first inner image. Did you have a starting image for this book? Yes, I think this book started with several things. I, I think every book starts with several kind of several things at the same time. Um, of course, I had been I have been had been re reading and studying a lot about the Sami conflict in 1852 for a lot of years, and I, I never thought I, I was just like, oh, I'm so interested in conflict. I I don't know if I will never use it in a in a novel. I did so. I I had this kind of uh, I had, but I really wanted to use it. So I had this kind of idea that I wanted to send the, my character. I, I need, I needed her to be a priest, and I needed her to be a, a woman priest, present tense. I did not want to write a historical novel, so I need to kind of find a, a conflict where I could send my protagonist in in into the present tense. But I also wanted her to go to to go to this place where the conflict had had uh, started so I wanted her to go so I had that in mind and I had a lot of images of of the town where she's living which is in inside my head that is Vatsa which which is uh, the town a town in 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 Finnmark uh, near close to where I grew up um But I think also I had, I think also I had very much, because I think for me, all my novels kind of start with, with the previous novel. They, they kind of, the, the previous novel kind of kicks off the next one. And the previous novel was, uh, I retired was a total retirement from society and from literature. It was kind of like saying, this is all bullshit. This is all nonsense. This is all lie. This is, I don't believe in anything. I just, I just drive out. I had my character put all her stuff into this little yellow car and she's just driving off, leaving everything. So, so I just had this, and, and, and I did the, that also in my very private life. I left everything. I left my publishing house. I left my husband. I left, I, I left my life in a way. So I kind of left everything. And I, after having left everything, I understood that, okay, I have left everything, but nobody's going to catch. I mean, nobody's coming. I, if I want to be part of a society, I, I need to find a way to, I, I need to come back. I, I need to be the person who joins, who kind of returns. So in a way, I kind of knew that my, I had to make my character drive into society again. So I, I make leave drive into society again, because I, I needed to kind of come back to the others. So, so, um, uh, so, so it's it's so it's packed with a lot of images at the same time, and a lot of emotions. Lovely. We have two more. Um, it's an inspiring idea to write for oneself or to write for a solitary reader. 
rather than for an imagined unknown audience that sometimes feels oppressive. Do you have any suggestions for how to write for yourself in a time of so much social noise? Yes, I, in the way, in the way, I, I think that it's a very good question. It's a very important question because I think that is exactly, if you're going to write, you have to kind of leave all that social noise out because I think if you're ever going to write something that will be important for others, it has to be first important to yourself. And for it to be important to yourself, it, you have to cut out all the, all the social noise. And then maybe the question is how to cut out all the social noise. But I think if you really listen inside, and I think it sounds, oh, oh, oh you should listen inside and do all these exercises, blah, blah, blah yoga, blah, blah, blah. But, but what I think is really interesting, important is to kind of, I think, to do some kind of real, real deep exercise uh, to, to kind of, to, to, to relax. I think when you really can do some deep relax, then you get into contact with yourself. And, and, and when you enter into contact with yourself, you somehow feel what is deeply important for yourself to write and if you write from there be as good as bad as it can be but that is all you can do and I think that's what at least that is what I tell myself <laughs> so yeah but I think to kind of what I what I really do is kind of to to try to really relax I have this position, I lie on my back on the floor and I have this 90 degrees of, of my, my, my knees on my sofa and I lie with my back on the floor and with this 90 degrees and, I, and, and, and that is a way to kind of, to have the spine totally relaxed into the pavement and I do that for 15, 20 minutes. Of course, this is something I do now Two years ago, I did something else. So find your own way to do something. But, but I think to relax and to, to kind of to, to go inside and then write from what is there. And, and, and if you really listen to what is important inside yourself, there is no more social noise. Mm. Thank you, Hannah. That, that is beautiful. Um, Another question from Jennifer. I fell in love with the pastor, went on to read Love, and I'm obsessed. Your theme of language speaks profoundly to me. Um, she, she mentions, in my intro, I mentioned the upcoming novel Te Amo. Um, oh, and she, she asked, do you have any advanced review copies that readers could read and re review in the U.S.? I don't think you have those copies, Hannah, but um, we could put the link in the chat, Ashley, for um, Archipelago. But Hannah, will you tell us a little bit about Tiamo? Yes. Can I, can I just run to get it to show it to you? Huh? It's just yeah. inside my room behind here. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that you asked about Tiamo. This is the Norwegian version that is pink. Mm. I'm sorry, I have to get the book. I wrote too far to get it though. Because it's related to this book. That is called Roman, which is called, which is in English novel, novel Milano, 
and this is kind of the pink that is kind of gray gray and blue and this pink and gray and tiamo this is the italian version that just came out and this is the german version uh, tiamo tiamo is the norwegian my norwegian publishing house called it a novel i to me it's more like a documentary it's like not not a documentary it's like a document that i wrote during i wrote it in 10 days when my husband when i realized that he was going to die in january uh, 2020 like almost two years ago now he was very ill from cancer and um we had met in 2015. No, that's no, that's that's we have been all oh, this. No, we met in 2016. We've been to, we. It's like five years since I I've been in Italy now, and and we had two years when he was not ill, and then he and then we had two years when he was very ill from cancer. And then he died, and 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 then he was the big love of my life, and 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 he was. It was wonderful to meet him, and it was terrible to live, uh, to live with knowing that he was going to die, and and he did not want to talk about death, and he did not want to. He had uh, he had cancer in in pancreas, uh, pancreatic cancer that is one of the most violent and and killing forms of cancer, uh, and and uh, he did not he he never informed himself about anything. He he didn't want to die and he didn't want to talk about it. So uh, so not so so the text I wrote I called it Tiamo, which means I love you in Italian because he, he was Italian. I went to Italy uh, to live with him uh, uh, when I met him and, um, and we spoke Italian together and, and, and we did not talk about death, but this text that I wrote during these 10 days is a text between an I and a you and the you was him. And, and, and in the text, I could, could talk to the you in the text about everything that I could never talk with him in. So in a way I, I, I had to write this text because I was so lonely with knowing that he was going to die and not being able to talk to him about it. So in the text, I could write to you in the text talking about death that I could not talk with him about so in in a way the text was kind of taking care of my reality leaving me able to deal in real life with his reality that was that he did not want to talk about that so i could talk about that with this text where I could write, no, I love you. And we would say to each other continuously, I love you. In, instead of saying all the other things, I'm going to die. I don't want you to die. What will I do? What can we do now? I don't, what shall I do with all these days when death is the most visible thing in everything that there is? It's kind of, it was like death was everywhere, but we couldn't talk about it. But I could talk, so, so kind of the text, to care of my reality and and kind of contained it in a way for me so that I could go on living with him with his reality because for me I, I kind of I made a choice not to confront him with 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 what he did not want to talk about I, I found that that was for me that was respectful towards him to kind of not confront him with his death. If he didn't want to talk about it, who was I to kind of push death as a pillow into his face uh, if he didn't want to. So, so that was a choice I made, but, but I'm so, I was so grateful that I was able to, to write that, to write that text that was taken 
take care of my reality. So I, so that I could kind of survive that extreme, extreme time of our life together. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I, I cannot wait to, to read that, Hannah. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I'm so curious. I'm so curious about how Martin is going to translate it. It's so <laughs> I, I've been deeply I've been deeply involved with the Italian translation, and that it, it's so interesting how it, this is a German one. It's so interesting how they are. Translation is so crucial. Yeah, yeah I'm very curious. I'm I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, you're okay. Those are the last of the audience questions. Thank you, everyone. They were brilliant. Um, Lisa, do you, do you want to close us out? Oh, you're still on mute, Lisa. Um, just how absolutely beautiful it was to share this this time with you and 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 hear about your you shared so purely actually and so openly with us from your life and your writing. Um, it's just been an incredible privilege and a gift to to be with you. So thank you and, and carry on, carry on with your amazing work. And come visit me <laughs> in the States, okay? I expect you to come here and see me. Yes, okay? Yes. Please. I promise. I promise. will. Okay. I'm waiting for you, Always. okay? Yes, yeah. yeah. we'll have you whenever. Me too. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Getting some lovely messages in the chat. Thank you everyone for joining us. All right, thank be well you. and stay in touch, okay? Thank you, Pierce. Thank you everyone for coming. It was lovely to have you with us. Lovely, thank you all. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye for now.